Good morning. Good morning. Hi. My name is Cynthia Becker, and I'm a member of your Board of Trustees. And welcome to the North Shore Unitarian Church, where our mission is to empower people with greater depth, meaning, and purpose. Didn't you just love getting up this morning and there was sunshine? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I like the rainy weather. It's good for your skin. But it's really nice to be able to see the snow on the mountains and the beautiful colors in the trees. So I hope everyone has a chance to get out into nature before it starts raining again. In this community, we celebrate people from all walks of life, no matter how you make your living or how you experience the sacred. No matter who you are or who you love, we hope you will all feel welcome here. Next Sunday, the 29th, um, in the evening, from starting at 5, is our potluck, Halloween potluck and you're invited to come in costume and please bring a dish to share. And um, our youth group is going to be putting on a uh, haunted house along with uh, the, the guidance of um, Bill Richardson and, and Doug Sabrin. And oh, what else do you need to know about that as well? Um, if you are need a warm animal costume for your um, young ones, talk to Lynn Sabrin, our Director of Village Education, or um, Kara Elrod, who is our um, RE assistant. So once again, welcome everyone. Um, so courage. Um, for me, it's taken courage just to come here on Sundays and even more to get up today in front of all of you. <laughs> okay, that's it. Um, um, I may not be like many of you. I am from a long line of non-believers, atheists, I guess. I still haven't told my grandma that I come here. Um, <laughs> she would be disappointed in me. <laughs> Sometimes friends ask us to do things with them on Sunday mornings, and I make excuses like, um, my kids have a program that they go to or um, we're going to a lecture, so we can't come. <laughs> not really lies, but not really the truth either. So why don't I tell them I go to church? Well, I guess it's because religion gets a bad rap these days. And usually I just don't want to get into it. I mean, what am I going to say? That my religion is different more progressive, better. I fear what they picture in their heads when, if I would tell them that I go to church on Sundays. But actually, I think the biggest reason I don't often try and explain is because I'm still trying to figure out what this place means to me, too. But the longer I come here, the more I realize it's not actually about me finding the answer but about having found the place where I feel accepted and encouraged to keep coming and asking myself all the hard questions. I'm glad that I'm here, and I'm not alone in figuring it out. Um, any young people who want to come close for the story? Young people, big people, little people, anyone who wants to come up for the story? We'll make a little room in the pew so the people coming in have a little space. There's room for everyone. All right. Good to see you guys today. This is a story that comes from the subcontinent of India, from an ancient religious tradition called Jainism. And it's a story about six men, six men who were blind. They could not see. And they found out that there was an elephant in their village. And never having seen an elephant before, they were very excited and they thought, we'll go and learn about the elephant. What is an elephant like? They had never peanuts. seen. Peanuts. Huh? An elephant likes peanuts. That's correct. <laughs> they wanted to know, but okay, so it's hard, it's kind of hard to imagine, but you, you all know what an elephant looks like. It looks like this, right? It has these thick legs and, and, tusks. and tusks, really hard tusks. And a very long nose. 
and a very long nose. It uses it to drink water. And it uses the nose to drink water. It's also its mouth and a long tail. So these blind men, they had never seen, they could not see the elephant. They could only touch the elephant with their hands. And one man, he went up and he touched the elephant's legs. And he thought, oh, the elephant is like a long, tall pillar. Because he only touched the leg. And another man touched the tail. And it was like a rope. It was so long and windy and he could squeeze it in his hand. It was like a rope. And one man touched the trunk. And it was so windy and moving. He felt like it was like the branch of a tree. And one man touched the big ears, the big flapping ears of the elephant. And they could move. And they can move. And he thought, that's like a giant, like, like a big like leaf flowing. And, and, like, and like a jellyfish. Kind of, could be kind of like a jellyfish. I don't know if, if you know about jellyfish, but it could have been. And then one, one man touched just the belly, the big, solid belly of the elephant. And he was like, oh, it's like a wall. And then one, the last man, he touched the husk of the elephant. And he thought, oh, this is like a solid pipe. And then the men started talking with each other. And they were like, it's like a pillar. No, it's like a wall. No, it's like a rope. No, it's like a leaf. No, it's like a branch. And they just argued and argued and argued. Well, they were stuck because each of them had had the experience. They knew something about the elephant because they had touched it. And they were just arguing until a wise woman walked by. And she had the ability to see, and she had seen the whole elephant. And she said, you are all right, and none of you has the whole picture. And they were astonished to learn that there could be a creature that would have all of these different elements all connected. So it's just kind of an amazing thing that we can touch one part of something and we know that that's real and true from our experience, but we may not know no the, the whole. No the and no one had even touched the back, so they might have learned more if there had been another person to touch the back. They haven't even touched the mouth. And they didn't even touch inside the mouth. There's so much to explore about elephants. Oh, no, so, they didn't even touch the head. You guys are amazing explorers. Teeth, they didn't even touch the teeth. So there is so much to learn about the world, and there's so much that we can Not learn from each other. Not even in the butt. Not even there. Oh my gosh. Will you rise and body your spirit? Thank you all for the sharing with me the story of the elephant. My name is Ron Jones, and I've been asked to say a few words about why I value our North Shore church community. Many summers ago, I helped to design and present a worship service at the Unitarian Leadership School at Fort Warden, Washington. The service was called Growing Edges, and during that service, I quoted these words. Life on the edge means living creatively on the growing edge of my own life, as well as the growing edge of our church community. It means finding a way not just to survive, but to live with abundance of life. Life on the edge is stretching the boundaries of ourselves and our communities, for we pull them with us as we expand ourselves. Now, as I look back on my life thus far and my association with our North Shore Community Church over the past 50 years, I see that many of my own growing edges and abundance of life were inspired or supported by other members of this church community or by our wider Unitarian denomination. For example, many of you know that I love to travel and it was from Rose Nauman, a former member and herself a great traveler, that I was inspired to travel first to India, Kashmir, and Nepal, 
and later to Central and South America and to other parts of the world. When my, le when my legs were younger, I climbed several high mountains and volcanoes in France, Austria, Mexico, Central America, and Hawaii, as well as Mount Rainier in Washington. Those were high points in my life, and those too were inspired by my Unitarian connection. For the very first mountain that I ever climbed was on an excursion led by Philip Hewitt, the former minister of our Vancouver church, who led us up Mount Sedgwick on the west side of Howe Sound. For 23 years, I was privileged to be one of the chaplains of this church. I treasure that experience because it afforded me an opportunity to work creatively, both with couples getting married and with families who were celebrating a life, yet grieving the death of a loved one. Those encounters were challenging, yet rewarding. One little story. I remember asking a couple why they had chosen the Unitarian Church for their wedding. They replied that they were members of a band, that they had a gig every Saturday night, and so they needed to get married on a Sunday. They thought this might be a problem, but when they asked around, friends told them they should try the Unitarian Church because the Unitarian Church was open to anything. <laughs> Next February, I will be traveling to Honduras for the first time as a volunteer helping to build kindergartens in poor rural subsistence farming communities. Down there, I have sometimes experienced a natural high, being in a beautiful, exotic country, speaking with the local people in their own language, and feeling that I was being helpful and doing something worthwhile. And that part of my life, has a Unitarian root as well, for it came about through our Unitarian Church in Toronto, which is a sponsor of that program. Incidentally, if any of you would like to volunteer in Honduras next January, February, or March, I have a $1,000 credit that I can transfer to you. Of course, living at the edge can sometimes be precarious. On one of those trips to leadership school, I paddled a kayak to Fort Warden across the Strait of Juan de Fuca. It was only as I barely made it across the strait that I realized how foolhardy an enterprise that was, because the currents are very strong there, and I was lucky not to be washed out to the Pacific Ocean. The mission of our church is to empower people to live with greater depth, meaning, and purpose. We are called to stretch ourselves, to move from the familiar and the comfortable to the challenging and the unknown. I feel grateful to this community for inspiring, inspiring me and helping me to do that and for providing opportunities to move along those paths. I look forward to my next 50 years as part of our North Shore Community Church. And we, each week in this community of care and concern, we light two candles. The first, to hold and recognize those joys and sorrows present in those among us today and those in our community near and far. May the candle remind us of the truth that what is held by one here is held by us all. That what affects us one here affects us all. And we light a second candle of witness for those world events, those headlines and heartlines near and far that affect us, mind and heart. Today especially, I lift up the death of Gordon Downey and all of those lives who he touched with his journey and his music.
May we extend to all beings the compassion we offer one another here. Peace upon each and all. Several years ago, I was a volunteer on an organic farm. Um, and the farmers were a lovely couple, Andrea and John. And they were friendly, compassionate people who really strived to live their values. Um, they were um, vegans and grew vegetables and um, were pretty much hippie in every way you could be. <laughs> and um, each year they would send a Christmas card to the volunteers who'd come and worked on their farm. And it contained, you know, the basic, like, holiday greetings, and a little news about the farm. But then it included this long account um, of the different wildlife and wild plants and flowers that they had seen that year. They would mark the year through the eagles they had seen, the owls, the snakes, the foxglove, the huckleberries. And it was my favorite Christmas card to receive each year because it would remind me to maybe use a different lens to count my own blessings and to look at my own year. What were the moments? What were the moments as the song from the choir this morning from the musical Rent describes that I could measure my life in more than tasks completed? more than dollars saved or pennies earned. What were the sunsets, the midnights, the cups of coffee, the owl sightings, and the wildflowers that marked my year? How do you measure a year in a life? A question worth wrestling with. This summer, um, one of the things I did was offer a question box service where I invited people to come, and instead of preparing a sermon, I just answered questions that people wrote on index cards. And um, I think my sermon, my answering questions, was like over 45 minutes long. <laughs> so this question came at the end, and I didn't have a chance to answer it. And I wanted to answer it today. The question was, what do you love about North Shore Unitarian? I love that this community has held onto a vision for a long time to be more visible, more accessible, more inclusive, and more welcoming. I love that this community values the whole lifespan from the cradle to the grave. I love that members are willing to engage in honest conversations about death, making sacred space for one another, as in the Facing Death with Life class I witnessed last year. And I love that at the Halloween potluck, everyone comes together to rattle their bones, dresses up, and eats a little too much sugar. I love that there is so much excitement about newcomers. And as newcomers ourselves, that there has been so much openness to Marcus and I's ministry. I love that people speak up when they are tired and need a break and are ready to step down. I love the dedication I see in our leadership. From the many lay leaders and staff, I know how hard you work to make this place possible. And most of all, I love your big dreams. A new building, a site on public transit, so many new programs, I can't even keep the list going. More justice work, more inclusivity to people of different cultures and traditions. So many ideas of how we can partner and collaborate to create a more loving and just world. That dreaming, that vision, that hope, I think, is of ultimate value. And I would suggest there is nothing more valuable for a community to have than hope. Last summer, uh, last spring, 
We celebrated 50 years as a congregation, and it was a great joy to see founding members. I think Ron is one of them present and joining in the celebration. And as we begin the canvas season of our church year, the time when we say to one another, the resources we have come from the gifts. They come from the generosity and the friends and members present. The truth is that all of us have received. We have received this community from the people who came before us. We don't pay a pledge for the services that we get. We give a gift to the people coming in the door after us. The founding members who birthed this congregation were filled with hope, and they passed a gift along to us. And all those who tended this community in the early, early stages and who have given over the last 50 years have made it possible for people beyond themselves to be here on Sunday morning. As a colleague of mine pointed out, congregations close when they run out of money. But what they run out of far before that is vision. They run out of hospitality. They run out of a willingness to open the doors and say, come on in. Things may be a little wonky sometimes, but the choir is fantastic. The kids are loved. And in this place, there is a spirit of openness, respect, and care. This fall, I set a goal for myself that I didn't meet. <laughs> My hope was to count the number of hours that people volunteer for the congregation. I thought, if I could just get a rough number for a month, a week, and a year. I got stuck and overwhelmed <laughs> counting your volunteer hours. I know how many RE teachers we need to run the children's program and how many people come into the office, but then I tried to count the buildings and grounds volunteers and then everyone who makes soup and then everyone who makes cookies and then everyone who greets and ushers and everyone who's working on a project. It was a number that I gave up on counting. And even if I could count the hours, there are things I could not count the blood, the sweat, the tears that have gone into certain decisions, the struggle, the love, the dedication, the showing up. It's not an accurate numerical metric. Recently, I heard a study uh, from a podcast called Hidden Brain, and it was describing that um, there was two groups. One group was given furniture already assembled, put together, ready to go in your home. And the second group was given some measure of IKEA <laughs> furniture in boxes and pieces and with an instruction manual. And people were asked to assemble the furniture and then put it in their home. And this other group was just given the furniture and put in their home. And they asked people to value the furniture. How much is this worth to you? You can probably guess the people who assembled it valued it so much higher than the people who just received it all put together. So it is like the story of many hands touching the elephant. You can ask each one of us what it is that brings us, what it is that we're here for, what it is that we value, and everyone will have a right answer, and it will not be the whole elephant. Community, Wendell Berry writes, I am beginning to understand is made through a skill I have never learned or valued. The ability to pass time with people you do not know well, talking about nothing in particular, 
with no end in mind, just to build trust, just to be sure of each other, just to be neighborly. A community is not something that you have, like a camera or a breakfast nook. No, it is something you do, and you have to do it all the time. This is what I see when I watch people at coffee hour. I see the gestures, the body language that says, hello, how are you? In my awkward and bumbling way of not being sure if I know your name or if you're really so-and-so's partner or husband or wife or daughter or friend, I just wanted to say that I'm glad you're here, that you're someone who shows up and I'm somebody who shows up and that somehow in some way matters so much. just showing up an enormous contribution. And of course, when we show up, things happen. A story from a minister. She uh, thought she was looking really good. Thought she had it all together. She checked herself in the mirror before she went out. And indeed, she was looking good. She was ready for coffee hour. But she went about her business, running errands, taking care of business. And when she gets to the church, someone immediately pulls her aside. Oh, honey, you've got some gum on your butt. (sighs) And she said, you know, that's what church is all about. You show up thinking you may have it looking good and all together, or maybe not, but somebody is there who sees what you cannot see, who is touching a part of the elephant you may not have touched. (laughs) Somehow has a different meaning. Um, So you got all your stuff on. You feel like you're looking good. You check the mirror and you're right. You're looking good. But the mirror only shows the front. You got a piece of gum on your butt and you don't know. And you go out and you strut your stuff and you're walking all over town and hopefully you run into somebody who loves you, who knows you, who can say to you, oh honey, come right here with me. I'll take you to the washroom. So, I guess what I'm saying is, give generously to this congregation so that (laughs) you too will have people to get the gum off your butt. (laughs) Of course, that's not exactly it. But it is true that belonging with heart is at the core of our mission. Someone made a place for us. Someone welcomed us in. Someone made it possible for us to sit on a cushion or a bench or a new chair and to experience kindness and stillness and to set down our troubles for a time. Someone before us gave us this gift. It is ours to pass on. It is ours to share. And really, it is the greatest mission that we have. Not to give so that we might have something good, but to give so that others may experience goodness as well. Reverend Susan Frederick Gray is the one who I learned this from. She's the president now of our Unitarian Universalist Association, and she preached about how it's, it's tempting to think of it as a pay-for-service thing. Oh, you know, I go mm, one Sunday every three weeks, so my pledge should be this amount, because that's about a third of what they're suggesting. And she says that that is a mentality which will limit us personally and as a community. We can recognize the gifts we have received 
and we can recognize what we have to pass on. The truth is our work is our, as a congregation is about more than ourselves, more than the people who are in this room right now. Our work is about moving beyond these walls into the service of life, into the work of justice-making, healing, transforming, attending to the pain of the world, celebrating and marking the joy of the world. At home, Marcus and Henry and I have started a more regular practice of holding hands and singing before we eat dinner. Very simple song, but it gives us a moment to stop and breathe and look at one another and say thank you. And life is, you know, often hurried up until dinner and sometimes chaotic after dinner. And so this moment has become very precious to me. My two-year-old son, Henry, also likes this moment. In fact, he likes it so much that once we have sung our first song of grace and eat a few bites, Henry is reaching out his hand saying, sing again, sing again, sing again. And sometimes we sing grace now four or five times <laughs> before the meal is over. And the first few times that he did this, I thought, oh, it's so adorable. <laughs> it's like mindful eating. My little sensei son reminding me to be grateful after every bite. <laughs> now, of course, after a few weeks, I want to snap at him <laughs> when he says, sing again at the dinner table for the third time. Just let me eat in peace. I want to yell at him, I'm done being grateful. I'm done being generous. I just want my food. I share this as a, an awareness because for some of you, this is the 10th or 20th or 30th or 50th time you have been asked to be grateful and to give to this community. And you might be like me at the dinner table thinking, do we have to do this again? Can we just get this over with so I can eat? I understand. But like I have to hold my tongue with Henry, I also have to recognize that giving is not something that happens once and is done. It happens over and over again. And if you are new, to our community or newer, and this is the first time that you've heard us ask for a canvas, for a pledge, you may be wondering, what am I doing? I don't think I have enough. What would be enough? What am I supposed to do again? And I want to hold you with love and care in that place as well. I think Rebecca's story this morning was so accurate. It can be so hard to say what I'm doing is going to church what I'm giving money to is a church, when that has a whole history of meanings that we may wrestle with. And so I just invite you to reflect on why it is that you come. What is the beauty or sweetness that you have found here? And how might you give to share that with others? I am aware as well that there is a tendency within us from our limited vantage points, where we can only see the trunk or the tail, and we wonder if what we have to give is enough. We live in a world that tells us more, 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 for me, me, me. And so it is a spiritual challenge to recognize those stories and to take an action in service of what we desire to create. The world may tell us that security comes from counting the dollars in our savings account. And it might be that security is more about the number of loving and supportive connections in our lives. The people who will tell us, oh honey, you got some gum on your butt. So with that, I invite you 
I invite you to live out our faith, which says all are worthy, all have something to give, all have something worthy to offer. A story to close from black theologian Howard Thurman. He describes how he was walking past an elderly man planting apple trees. And the man stopped and uh, he, Howard Thurman stopped and he said to the man, you know, what are you doing? You're working so hard, you're quite elderly. Why are you planting these trees? You're not gonna be around when these bear fruit. And the man replied, all of my life, I have been eating from trees I did not plant. All of my life, I have been eating from trees I did not plant. Let us plant an orchard together so that those who come after us will taste the sweetness of this beloved community. Amen. Blessed be.